Welcome to the Bulwark Podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. It is Friday. And uh, as, as, as I sat down to write my newsletter this morning, I was thinking, you know, what, what am I going to say about um, the awfulness of what happened yesterday? I mean, yesterday, it did feel like peeling back this onion of awfulness. The more you thought about it, the worse the situation be- became. And so I, I started my newsletter by saying this is a hard newsletter to write because there's no sugarcoating it. Yesterday was the worst day of the Biden presidency. But that really shouldn't be the point. I mean, the bombing in Kabul was this national tragedy, this human tragedy that's going to have long-term ramifications. And some of us are actually old enough to remember when the shock of losing the lives of 13 American servicemen would have brought us together, if only briefly as a nation, but that's certainly not the case right now. Um, And as I wrote in the newsletter, I said, as far as I can remember, Democrats didn't demand George W. Bush's resignation um, on the morning of 9-11. Um, we had 241 Marines killed in Lebanon, but I don't think that, I mean, there was a lot of criticism, but nobody said that Ronald Reagan should be impeached. They they didn't discuss the 25th Amendment. I mean, the Bay of Pigs was this massive disaster, but I don't remember that Republicans immediately called for JFK's resignation, but here we are. And here's Tim Miller with us to <laughs> help me peel back this onion of awfulness. Hey, how you doing, Tim? Woof, Charlie. I don't. I, I'm, I'm not really thrilled that I got the. I, I got you know called out of the bullpen for this one. Um, yeah, look, we're very much mind melding though because I had this thought yesterday. It was one of the un untweeted thoughts. I'm trying to have more of those these yeah. days. Untweeted thoughts. Um, and, but it was I, like. I, I don't know that we are capable right now as a country of coming together the way that we did after mm-hmm. 9-11, right? I, I, it's just even if something as horrific as 9-11 were to happen, it's hard to imagine that we would survive 24 hours of everyone on all sides, you know, rallying around the flag. Um, and that is a pretty distressing thought to say the least. It is a distressing thought. And, you know, I, I got I, you know, let, let's just step back for a moment here, you know, to talk about what happened yesterday. And, and again, I, I wrote this in, in, in morning shots, which you can subscribe to, but, you know, I, I don't know, maybe it is because I'm, I'm getting older that these things do hit me harder uh, every single year. You know, I, I, maybe it's kind of knowing, having seen the pain caused by families, knowing what a hole there is, how long it lasts. And I think, Joe Biden actually gets that. He says, you know, there's a hole that that you never really fill in. And so these, you know, in movies, you know, people move on from the tragedies, right? And they have a happy ending. In real life, it's not like that. But also, look, uh, we're going to we're going to continue debating this 20 year war and its futility. And we're certainly going to be debating, you know, how the Biden administration screwed up this withdrawal. And I think that they they did. And people are going to say, you know, was it worth it? These are all legitimate questions. But you know, can we just take a moment to just to note that that nobody should doubt the courage of those guys who were in Kabul yesterday. I mean, they knew what the mission was. They understood the risks. We had these warnings out there and they gave their lives to save who knows how many people, how many generations uh, of people. I mean, since last month, you know, we've had more than 110,000 people evacuated. A lot of those people were saved from almost certain deaths. So, this mission yesterday was not futile and their deaths were not meaningless. They did not die in vain. And I, I think that we have to remember that whole worlds have been rescued because of their courage. So whatever, all this other stuff, just put it aside. You know, what's what they are doing right now and they didn't make the policy, they didn't make the decisions, but they're standing there at the gate saving these people, families, you know, generations from now will exist because they are making these sacrifices. I know that may sound, hor- you know, corny, but I, if we could just take a moment to acknowledge these guys before we go back to the partisan bullshit finger pointing, you know what I'm yeah, saying? I, I don't think it sounds corny at all. Okay. I, I mean, look, I said this yesterday. I, I just, um, I am blown away by the military response to this, and you know, I, I don't come from a, from a military family, um, you know, so I, or and I, I didn't serve in the military, so I, I don't have this kind of deep well of you know relationships. But you know, of, over the years, you 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 make friends, um, you know, college buddies, people that I'd worked with that served, um, you know, big supporters of the bulwark who have served, who have been talking to us, obviously. 
Bill and others, um, you know, have deep relationships. And so I've been, I've been having conversations with a lot of folk veterans, um, you know, folks that were active I, I, the, and, and, you know, then, you know, doing research for, for the stories have been, you know, kind of going down social media dives. I, I, I can't find anyone that was evolved, involved in the Afghanistan war that's, that's response to the last two weeks has been, we should get our boys out first, you know, and be safe. You know, there, there are a handful of talking heads that have said that, but all of the military folks that I've seen and talked to have wanted to do more, have recognized the danger, have recognized that the, the ISIS threat, which obviously Biden warned about very explicitly um, just the other day, one of his previous remarks, they, they all knew. And if anything, their complaints have been, let us go in. You know, yeah. let us go get more people out. Let us put ourselves at greater risk. Like, like we want to, you know, do everything we can to get everyone out. And that's how we're wired. And, and that is just at the core of our service. And and for all of the terribleness and all of the, all of the bullshit, like that has just been unbelievably inspiring. And, and, you know, I, I don't, obviously we don't know the 13 or, or whatever the number is going to be and end up being that, that died yesterday. But 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 the vast preponderance of their colleagues like all feel the way that you said that not only did they not die in vain but on, on a very important mission uh, that you know that they want to be you know put in um, to help with and 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 so I I just I, I do think that in that sense like that this has been a really inspiring period despite you know also you know the deep depressing elements of it as well about our political culture well and, and there are deep depressing um revelations about the political culture but but you you and i before we started we sort of mind melded as well on on the one story that kind of if, if we're looking for some glimmer of hope here you know on this theme of of, of courage um because and you you brought it up before i did which is this abc story yeah. uh about the pineapple express if people have not heard about the pineapple express this is an amazing story this is u.s special operations vets carrying out daring uh, daring mission to to save the afghan allies i mean this is this is really something i mean this group this pineapple express you know shepherding hundreds of like 500 of at-risk Afghan elite forces and their families to safety. And these are all volunteers. I mean, this is, this is really quite a story about these guys. Yeah. And it seems like that they are, um, you know, uh, like working a little bit in tandem again to this point about how the military guys want to do more with the folks that are stationed in, in Kabul, right? Because they, you know, they, there are limits that have been set. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not going to certainly, you know, armchair quarterback exactly, you know, where are, you know, the military thinks are, you know, our, our men and women should be going, especially given the, the threats and, and what we saw yesterday. But but for whatever reason, the military has decided that they can't they they do not want to send people outside of the protective zone outside the, the airport. And so they're working with these volunteers who are who are flying into Kabul and, and doing exfils in the dead of night, targeting um, people that were the, at the highest level helping us fight uh, this war over the last 20 years. They're, they're friends, you know, people that they'd worked with closely, that they know that, that that are maybe well known to the community as having worked with Americans and, and would be, you know, certainly at great risk of persecution or death, um, you know, once we once we pull out. Um, um, uh, widows, you know, orphans, kids and, and, and wives of, of uh, interpreters and people that have worked with us who have died. Um, and you know, go and so flying and finding them, and then you know playing this you know Taliban Frogger game that I talked about in the in the <laughs> refugee not my party episode to get to get around to kind of duck the Taliban guys um, because some of these folks don't have the the visas and the paperwork that are necessary to get through the checkpoints right now, 
uh, get them through, um, communicate with, you know, our, our, you know, men and women that are at the airport and, and, and get them onto the airplanes. Uh, and they were doing it up through, uh, uh, it seems like it, you know, they weren't exactly specific about this in the story, but it seems like possibly one, some of them or one of them got injured in the blast. I mean, they, yes, they, you right. know, uh, doing this all up until the moment of, of the terror attack outside the airport. So, I mean, just absolutely amazing. I tweeted if, if, if uh, everyone should read the story and then I went down a rabbit hole and found the guy that is organizing this and, and tweeted his GoFundMe. If people want to support it, it's a saving heroes. I just just did it right before I got on. It's just an absolutely unbelievable story, and and it just speaks to this like there is there is to whatever people think about the merits of the war. There is I think this really deep goodness in this in the American spirit of we were here for this mission. These folks helped us. They're our responsibility. Uh, you know we owe this to them, and and we're gonna do what it takes to sacrifice ourselves and to, to put ourselves at risk to get as many of these people out. I, I that is a, a really wonderful mindset. Um, I, I, I wish was shared more widespread among our politicians at the moment, but, um, but it, it is a really American thing, right? It it's, is, it obviously is. there are good people everywhere, but like this, this notion <laughs> no. that, that if we, you helped us, you are one of us basically, yeah. and you can be part of our country and we need to get you here. I, like that is, is is really the most heartwarming thing of the you know amidst all this. Well, that's what makes days like this so complicated because at the same time that we're you know seeing this terrible tragedy and this uh, this policy foobar, we're also seeing really the best of us. That in 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 many ways, yes, it it is a catastrophe as we've said many many times, but it's also. You know, at the same time, one of our finest hours, and we ought to be able to say that. So should we just talk about you, you? Let's draw the contrast between you know this this the service and the courage and the the, the politicians. I mean, I'm I just yeah. I'm struck by the we, we you know, we've said before that we're living in a in a post shame political culture and the shamelessness is a superpower. It is still breathtaking. I mean, number one, how so many Republicans and Trumpists are completely memory holing. Uh, you know, Trump's surrender to the Taliban. And, you know, you know, I, I know you guys were talking about this last night on, on the live stream, you know, the hardcore Trumpists who were saying, you know, if Donald Trump was there, we'd still be in Afghanistan. He would have done everything right. Donald Trump wanted to pull out in May, you know, and, <laughs> and, and, and if, if Donald Trump had been reelected and we'd pulled out in May, uh, you know how many Afghan, uh, these Afghan translators would get out? Probably none because Trump's own, you know, anti-immigration, xenophobic, humunculus, Stephen Miller, had essentially shut down the entire visa program. So all these people, yeah, it's what a screw up. Their memory, and then you have people like Josh Hawley. Could you just talk to me about Josh Hawley, who uh, issued sure. a statement in May saying that, you know, Trump was right and Biden was right and we should get out right now. And now he's saying that Biden needs to resign. I mean, the guy is... What, what the hell, you know? Um, yeah, I'm very much in like a pox on all their houses mode right now, Charlie, yeah, yeah. on the politicians. So I, I'm I'm re I'm ready to go off. Holly Holly is a good place to start, though. Um, you know, he so as we were approaching the May deadline, he sent out a press release ripping Trump, ripping uh, Biden. You yeah. know, saying that we needed to get out sooner. I'm sorry. Uh, that's right. Know, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Saying that we need to get out sooner, and 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 you know, basically, you know, saying that he he need to live up to Trump's deal, and that we can't be. I don't know if he used the word forever wars. I don't have it in front of me, but right, like that. That that was. His take was that Biden was not following, you know, Mr. Trump's great deal. Back in back in May, I mean, I mean at that point, we hadn't got out anybody. You know, I like uh, uh, Biden was. I think up, up through July, I gotten out. There were 485 refugees that have gotten out, and and we we're getting out about 800 SIVs a week. I, I it was, uh, you know, we wouldn't have even gotten to 10,000 people out of there had, had we had we just pulled out in May. Um, and, and then today, you know, or yesterday, he puts out a press release saying that Biden needs to resign. Like he didn't get all of our people out. It's just like this shamelessness, just this yeah. grotesque shamelessness from, from from a person that was that was like leading the charge for for these irresponsible you know pullouts. And 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 so you know you get the oh well like we would have kept Bagram and it's like maybe it's like, right? I, who the hell who the fuck knows what Trump would have done? Okay, here's the, one of the other problems with Trump, right? Is that like you you didn't he was so uh, you. 
you know, uh, uh, um, unpredictable. He was so erratic. Right. And so who the hell knows what he would have ended up doing? He had four years to try to execute a, a exit. He said he was against the Afghanistan war for four years. He never got out. So who, so maybe he would have stayed. I, 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 you can't say what he would have done. Maybe he would have popped off and bombed people. But like the idea that there would have been this orderly exit is, is just preposterous. And, 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 and that you can argue in the same, with the same voice, oh, we need to get more people out, you know, and, yeah, uh, um, you know, and that Trump would have done this right. I mean, it's it's the reason why more people out is the reason why more people aren't out is because of Trump's four years. Like we had a refugee ban, remember that? We had a Muslim ban, and then we had a refugee ban, and then we lowered the cap on number of refugees, and then you know Stephen Miller's whole life goal was to gum up the works inside the visa offices to bring as many as few brown people here as possible. So so like yeah, and we could have had. Uh, um, I don't know how, how many we've airlifted out at this point, about 90 plus thousand. No, it's you know, 110. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah 110,000. Okay, so yeah, we could have had half those people out before we even started this process, right? I mean, you know, if we were, if we were getting out 10,000 a year meticulously going back to 2017 as part of a, a consistent plan for what we were going to do to slowly withdraw from Afghanistan. But like, that's not what they did. They had their opportunity. They fucked it up. So well, that and, doesn't, and we yeah. can get to the Biden people because no, we're going to get yeah. to them. In, yeah, them. But they fucked it. They fucked it up. And now they're, and now they're trying to act like, you know, Oh, this thing that I wanted, this thing that I called for this thing that I attacked Biden for not doing fast enough. Now I'm upset that, you know, he didn't stick around. <laughs> well, now, course, and, it's like, go screw and, and, and yourself. And then they'll, of course, completely pivot to, and we absolutely can't have these really dangerous refugees who are all suicide bombers right. admitted to this country. They will do this without without blinking, okay? So speaking of, of Donald Trump, Donald Trump is, is you can tell he's very, very excited about all of this because he's on just about everybody's show, uh, including um, Hugh Hewitt, who... <laughs> Do you remember when, when, when Hugh had a reputation of being a good interviewer? No, I actually don't either. But I do. You know, I do. So I, was, I was wondering whether or not yeah, that was one of my, was, my false memories. You know, I, <laughs> no, he was he was at least indifferent. Okay. You know, he would ask different okay. questions. So I think people we we felt like it was good because at least it wasn't the same bullshit. So uh, we okay. that was his little Houdini act to make. Well, us well think this is rather good. extraordinary. So the the former guy calls into Hugh Hewitt and. He's actually, this is one of those moments where you got to sort of have to take a deep breath and say, this actually happened. This is not a paragraph. He's, he's on the anniversary of coming up on the anniversary of September 11th. He's suggesting that Osama bin Laden wasn't that big a deal. Uh, he only had one hit, not nearly as big a deal as the people that he took out. I, and, and, and again, as you, as you listen to this, imagine if Barack Obama had said anything like this. Imagine if any Democrat had said anything like this, any liberal anywhere, anywhere had said this uh, in the, you know, in, in the vicinity of September 11th. Here, here's Donald Trump on with Hugh Hewitt. And we took out the founder of ISIS, al-Baghdadi, and then, of course, Soleimani. Now, just so you understand, Soleimani is bigger by many, many times than Osama bin Laden. The founder of ISIS is bigger by many, many times, al-Baghdadi, than Osama bin Laden. Osama bin Laden had one hit, and it was a bad one in New York City, the World Trade Center. But these other two guys were monsters. They They were were monsters. monsters. Yes. So Osama bin Laden had the had the one hit. Now that's true. If you forget the fact that there were two hits in New York, there was the second tower, and if you forget the Pentagon, and if you forget Flight ninety three, if I mean it goes on and on and on, and yet Hugh Hewitt. Yeah, it also didn't start there. No, no, no. Uh, there were like, some of the terrorist attacks in the well, 90s. We, we, kind of, yeah. and we knew about that. So, and then Hugh Hewitt just goes on and like, you know, whatever. It's just like, it's just like, wait, 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 Hugh, do you realize what he just said? It's just like, okay, we, we know that you're this ridiculous hack, but, you know, I have a little bit of pride. You have to push back on this, though. You know, Osama bin Laden, the one hit wonder. I mean, really, really? The former president of the United States just said this? And you're not going to go, um, Mr. Ex-President, uh, can we talk about this? No. Uh, so, so here we are. So 
Yeah, I just can't with I all know. this trouble. I, I know. just really, I, know. I mean, like, I like the, the fact that he, no, 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 it's just like he, he is, he was such a disaster. He's such a nightmare. And like, he gets talked out of some things. You hear it on these interviews. It's just like, who the, it is true that I, the one thing that the, that the bad faith MAGA Trumpists have right about this criticism <laughs> of Biden is, is that Biden said what he was going to do and he did it. Um, don't like the execution. Um, uh, not, not probably what I, I, I would have hoped, but, but, but they say, well, Trump said he's going to do it, but that doesn't mean he would have done it. Exactly. <laughs> it's like true. And that's true. He could have talked to Hugh Hewitt the day before he was planning to pull out and decided, I, you know, I'm going to bomb Kandahar instead. Right. Like that. That was the whole thing of the last four years. Like he, he was a completely erratic mess surrounded by idiots and mooks. And occasionally, you know, a person, you know, would be able to talk sense into him and 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 he would talk himself down. So So you don't know exactly what he would have done. All you can all you can know is that. He put he supposedly put a plan in place. He released five thousand Taliban yes. prisoners, and he said he was going to hand things over to the Taliban, hand the keys over to him in May. Like that's what he said. What would he have done? Who the hell knows? But we should we you know certainly know it would not have been a well planned, well executed effort. No. Okay. So let's let's shift to uh, to Biden and Biden's d- defenders. Yeah. Uh, f- first of all, your your take on the Biden presser yesterday? Difficult moment. <laughs> I mean, his, that, it's a technical, his that's, comments, no, yeah, no, it's a go. technical <laughs> criticism. His comments were fine. His comments were good. Like his remarks, his scripted remarks were good. Um, I, I, you know, we could have used uh, some more substance on what we're going to do now. What's the plan? Obviously, I'm not asking that he give away CIA secrets, but but just a general sense for, um, for, for and I don't know if we know what we're going to do with the remaining uh, some hundred, we think Americans that are still in, in Afghanistan. Um, uh, but you know, obviously the tone, the empathy was much better than what we would have gotten, um, with the alternate, uh, the Q and a, he just, he's a prickly pair. He just is, he gets prickly. He doesn't like to be challenged. Um, most of the time that's fine, but, but he, like the Q and a period is over. And then he like chooses to pick a fight <laughs> with that it. little twerp, like the Ducey kid, and, and it's just like, why? why, why, why are you? Why do you even call on him if you can't? If you can't just answer, like, and and you know, and I saw I said this on Twitter, and everybody's like, I don't know, Peter Ducey picked the fight with him. He asked him a dickish question. It's like reporters' jobs is to ask dickish questions right like jim acosta asked dickish questions all the last four years did trump deserve it yeah it does like it's not about whether or not they deserve the question reporters ask jerky questions fox is full of shit half the time 90 percent of the time but so uh, granted right but but as the president you know, you've got 13 families of people that died yesterday. Yeah, there's no joking moments. Watching yeah. this press conference, it's not a time to just pick to, to pick a little fight with to pick a fight with Ducey. So, so that's that that was frustrating. You know, the other frustrating thing is just on the accountability. I, I thought that Shay and Ben, I've not agreed with everything that you know um, some of our friends have written at the Bulwark about all of the particulars of what Biden should have done differently. But but I do agree with the, this on the accountability article. Right, like I do agree with this. Somebody has something has to happen. You mentioned the Bay of Pigs earlier. There's this story of where Kennedy, you know, looked at Dulles after that and said, "If we were in a parliamentary system, I'd be gone after this, but we're an American system, so you you have to go. Right, you're fired, basically." And 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 I, you know, I don't know that doesn't somebody need to be fired for this? I mean, does it does I I, I just. We're in the middle of all of it, and so I understand that Biden's not going to like go around haphazardly firing people. But his the tone coming out of the administration is very laudatory of themselves, rather than man, like we really missed some stuff here. Like we we were totally wrong in how quickly this was going to go south. Once we saw it was going south, we didn't really adjust very quickly and get people out. I mean, there was a period of days where the Taliban was slowly adding cities yeah. where we could have started the airlift sooner, you know, if they re- if they thought, you know, um, um, I mean, there had to have been some intelligence about this. So, so look, uh, again, I, I'm not, you know, th- there are, you know, the particulars of exactly what it should have been. I, I don't know, yeah. but the, the idea that you can look at this and say, and say, oh, oh, well, certainly there shouldn't have been anything, you know, done differently, or we shouldn't have moved faster, we shouldn't have, you know, created a different perimeter. It's just, 
you know, there, there just is no way around no, that. that. And you're not, and, we're, and, and and the idea that like that he needs to be above criticism. This is well, the other let thing me, that, that really me, pisses me off. Let me yeah, get to sorry. that in a moment because because and that's going to be we have to take a deep breath for that. I mean, some of the defenders okay. who and who think that we should be defending all of this. Uh, no, um, as I've told people before, uh, never Trump does not mean always Biden. We don't have to do that. But you know, yes, when, when you look at the situation, I mean, seriously. Um, you know, how, 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 that's what I mean by the, the onion of awfulness. When you look at the fact that we're relying on the Taliban, that the Taliban cannot obviously control, um, their own city or they, which they obviously don't completely control this whole ISIS K, um, is not the Taliban, which complicates everything. But if one of the questions we had in our mind was, will Afghanistan become a haven for terrorists, a base for terrorists? Would the Taliban be able to keep them out? Well, the answer is very, very clearly no, in the most dramatic possible way. Um, if we were at Bagram, would this be somewhat different if we had our own perimeter? Uh, I was listening to some military people talk about that. You know, we were there for years, hunkered down when there were no American casualties because we had the military force to protect the entire area. And yet we chose to shut that down in the middle of the night and to relocate everything to the, the, the Karzai airfield where you're basically just right up against it. And it's just, it's so mind boggling. And again, the, this doesn't take anything away from the courage of the servicemen, but it certainly calls into question all of the planning. So I wonder whether or not what happened yesterday shook the White House. There's this David Ignatius piece that's, that would suggest that uh, this uh, th this was a significant blow to some of the happy talk in the White House. Um, so we'll, we'll see whether they they change gears. But I want to get to your, your point. That there's a yeah. whole group of people just, out there oh, who okay. are deeply invested in saying everything is fine. It's going great. He's doing a good job. And some of these are people that we've been aligned with before. Matthew Dowd, Jennifer Rubin. This is wonderful. This is great. He's doing everything he should be doing. And then you have people on the left, you know, Ezra Klein, Matt Iglesias, who are totally all in that, that we shouldn't be criticizing, uh, shouldn't be criticizing Joe Biden because X, Y, or Z. Talk to me about that. Yeah, I, I, I just... A, it's extremely frustrating. Uh, in a democratic system, people have to be criticized. People have to be made better. Um, you know, re presidents respond to criticism. You know, people look and 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 consider consider their priors. Frankly, I, they, I think that the Biden administration probably would have done well to to listen to the criticism that was that was going on since April. I mean, it's not as if uh, you know. I, I know that, that there's this you know kind of trope out there that this was a big that nobody knew that the Taliban was going to um, take everything over so quickly but like that's not really true right there were there were warnings um there were letters from the hill as early as I, I don't I think June, um, you know, there were intelligence warnings as early as April. So what does that mean? Uh, does that mean that there could have been a perfectly smooth thing where everybody's going to the airport and it's just like, you know, me going down to Oakland airport to go through my clear line and get on the airplane? No, like obviously there was, it was going to be messy regardless, but, but it didn't, it didn't have to be this kind of messy. And, 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 and there could have been an urgency, you know, once the writing was on the wall that did, and, and, and it didn't feel like the urgency happened until after the Taliban had already taken over, right? And, and so that's my main criticism, right? I'm not a military strategist. I don't know whether it should, they should have been a Bagram or Karzai. I've heard people make both arguments. I think both arguments are, uh, have, have very compelling points. My criticism is, where was the urgency for this mission back in April when you knew the deadline was coming, you knew Biden wasn't wavering, and you knew you had to get people out? And as far as the people that, that don't appreciate, don't like that criticism and that say, oh, you guys, you're just a neocon or you're just, you're going back to your Republican ways. That's all such bullshit. And, and let, let me just, I, I know, I don't really want to talk about the politics today, but let me just give okay. you a one minute sure. assessment of the politics. Donald Trump is, is, is not certain to run in 2024. And if you're Donald Trump and you want to get inside that like warped lizard brain of his and, and you look at what's happening out there, what is the most likely thing to happen in the news that would make you want to run again? It's Biden fucking up, 
Like the worse Biden looks, the more likely it is that Trump's like, I can I can beat this yeah. guy. I can get back in there. Right. I mean, Trump, as irrational as he is, as insane as he is, he understands the media. He understands he has this lizard brain for kind of, you know, the the narrative, if you will. And and he does. The narrative is bad for Biden. He's much more likely to run. I don't want Donald Trump to be the president again. I don't know if people have noticed that. That's been a pretty important thing about my political activism over the last five years. I want Joe Biden to succeed. And, 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 and so like the idea that the way to do that is to just alibi everything that Joe Biden ever does, no matter how, how bad it gets, is wrong. If, if, Biden, if, if things are starting to go wrong, Biden needs to make changes to get things back on track uh, uh, in order to a hopefully prevent Trump from running, uh, or you know, God willing, hopefully he has a heart attack, or you know, the the courts take care of this, but I'm not wishing for that. Or, or b if he does run, be in a strong enough political position to beat his ass again, right? Like that's what I care about. In addition to you know the people that we need that worked with us in Afghanistan that we need to get out. In addition to our military, but from a political standpoint, that's what I care about. And and it just it's really frustrating to see this kind of cult-like atmosphere around Biden. It's like the, the way to help him is to just, you know, own the cons. I've, I've lived through an own the libs mindset. I, I've, seen, I've seen the result of that. I don't think that means the Democrats are going to spur, spur their own Trump, but, but there, can, there are a lot of other problems short of that that come from that. that, that the only thing that matters is, 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 you know, winning the Twitter battle of the day against the right. That's bullshit. Yeah, and, and I, again, it doesn't do any favors not to encourage the Biden administration to get it wrong. But of course, the, the, you know, we live in this world where if you criticize A, that must mean that you are helping B. And I think it's exactly the opposite of all of that. Um, I would I would urge um, our, our listeners strongly uh, to go, go and watch your video on, on the refugees. Um, this is going to be the next big fight. And, and, I, and I hope that people don't take yeah. their, their eye off of all of this. And I don't know. I, I, the, the Republicans are absolutely convinced that this is going to work for them. And this will be the caravans. This will be the Mexican rapists. This will be the, you know, um, you know, I- I immigrants who are spreading the, the pandemic, uh, the Syrian refugees, whatever. I, I don't know that that's the way Americans are looking at this. I'm looking at some of these poll numbers and you, you look at more than I do. It seems that there's this vast bipartisan consensus about at least the Afghan translators. Um, and, and, and there's also just, this seems anecdotally, you know, just this up, this upsurge of, of American compassion for, for these people that I certainly don't remember when we were talking about the Syrian refugees. So again, yeah. you know, I, Kevin, Kevin McCarthy thinks that this is going to be a great issue for them. I, 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 I just have a, a sense that they're misreading this, this. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, maybe JD Vance in that Ohio primary among a primary electorate is going to get, you know, find some purchase with the racist comments about how the people that spent 20 years risking their lives for us might blow yeah, up them all. Right. Um, like, I don't know, like that, that BS, maybe that, maybe there's some purchase for that in, in a primary setting, but across the broad electorate. I don't see it. And, 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 and I think that Biden is actually a little cautious on this too. And he's been cautious on immigration. I, I think he learned lessons from not Trump's rise. Uh, he learned lessons from what happened to Merkel and others in Europe, but this just isn't that right. Like the Syrian refugee crisis was also like a mass asylum crisis, right? And there, there was like the, the people in, in Syria and, and in the diaspora there were, were able to get to, Germany and Greece, right? Like they were able to travel. It was a dangerous travel, but but many, many tens of thousands did travel to Europe. Like that's not going to happen here, right? There's not like a land bridge between Afghanistan and Alaska that, that people are going to be streaming across, right? And so, you know, it's a contained number. It's a lot of people. There's no doubt about that. It's a lot of people, but it's not kind of this overwhelming you know, number where like, I, you know, the, I think Germans were seeing Syrian refugees in the train stations and everywhere, right? Like it was, it was very much front of mind. Uh, and so I think that there is a, a lot of things at play. There's just a natural American sense that we need to do right by these people, that they did right by us, that we need to bring them to America. Um, I think that the Democrats have 
have become more um, pro-refugee during the Trump era as a little bit of natural support for refugee, plus a little bit of negative partisanship. I think negative partisanship is working in our favor right now with some Republican voters who want to own Biden by supporting refugees. And any Republican that wants to own Biden by supporting refugees, great. <laughs> um, that's that's a good use of owning the libs as far as I'm concerned, because we need to get these people through. Um, and so, yeah, I, I just think that politically speaking, it's a manageable um, uh, issue and, and even a, a good issue for Biden. And, and that uh, the more of the, these folks that we can get out and get here, the better, um, uh, obviously to your really poignant point at the beginning, it, it, it is, it was the purpose of this mission, by the way, this is, um, yeah. is, 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 and is the Americans who are there obviously, but also getting these folks who helped us and giving them a new life and, and the generational change that'll bring and, and they'll be great Americans. And so I, I'm, I, hopefully that will be another positive we, that comes we out. We have an opportunity to show whether we are worthy of their sacrifice. They gave their lives in order to get these people to yeah. safety. So what do, what do we do about all of this? Okay. So let's talk about the, Let's put this in some context here, and I, I want to sort of pivot to uh, what's going on with, with with the pandemic. Somebody tweeted out the other day, uh, just to put it in, in, in some context, that this week, in a, just a two-day period, more Americans died of COVID-19 than were killed in the entire 20-year war in Afghanistan. Now, I'm not minimizing anyone's sacrifices, and I, you know, I, I don't want to trigger anyone there, but it is interesting how we continue to you know, we, we, we continue to downplay or some, some politicians continue to downplay what is objectively a, just a massive threat to, um, um, you know, American health and human life. I mean, it used to be that people understood that, yes, we, we had freedom, we had personal choice, um, but we, we did not want to encourage people to behave in a reckless way that would cost human life. And that's just not the case. Now, last night, for people who are members of Bulwark Plus, and I would strongly urge you to consider joining, um, you have access to our Thursday night live stream. And you were on, uh, Tim, um, with with a, a coronavirus uh, expert talking about where we are at. So give me your sense of what was, what, what was his message and where, you know, we're, we're, we're on a pivot point now, aren't we? Yeah, and we could have did the whole yeah. hour on this yeah. if it wasn't for what's happening in Afghanistan. I just I have so much, so many thoughts um, and and outrage at our friends down south, but we can get to that in a second. Doctor Jaw was great last night. I, I don't. I would just you know recommend Bulwark Plus members listen to that, or if you're not, this is a great moment. Um, he is. I think the dean of, of Brown University Medical Health. Mm. I don't want to get that wrong. Um, at, at public health. Um, and uh, he has been. You know, there are a lot of uh, public health experts that have, you know, transitioned into the punditry space um, that are competing with you and me right now, Charlie, and that's fine. And there have been there's some better ones and some not as good ones. I, I just think he's been mm-hmm. the best. Uh, every time I've seen him on TV, every every time I've I've listened to him give a talk, um, he's very clear eyed, no BS. You know, not getting into the tribalist stuff. Um, you know, yeah, um, uh, you know, he's happy to call out kind of silly overreactions. And I, I was, I thought it was, you know, this, his Sturgis point last night was so right on. You know, he was like, he's like, we can't be against Lollapalooza or for Lollapalooza and against Sturgis. He's like, that's not the thing. Lollapalooza worked because people were vaccinated. There's a vaccine passport and they're outside. He's like, if Sturgis was just a motorcycle rally, I'd be fine with that. The problem was that then there are inside parties that happen afterwards, no vaccine passports, no masks, uh, people that are largely unvaccinated. And that's why you're seeing a surge in South Dakota. I, I, I just think that is, you know, he's very, on point on that. Um, his general sense is that this is way worse than people would have expected. He never would have expected a third of the country would refuse to get vaccinated. Delta has been more contagious um, than than people expected it was going to be. Um, he does think that we've got booster shots coming. Um, he rejects the misinformation out there on booster shots. Um, and without putting words in his mouth, I think, you know, folks, you should just listen to that. Um, very uh, supportive of the boosters. He pointed to Israel as, I think, an example of why boosters are going to be needed. Um, and, uh, you know, essentially, it's uh, this is a contagious but manageable virus, were it not for the fact that there are just mass swaths of the country that have like just completely descended into idiocracy and decided that they are going to like eat horse dewormer. 
um, you know, because a D-list television host tells them to, rather than so the, the, uh, take a vaccine that is that is so, that has clear. So, so when I first heard this story, I'll be honest with you, okay, because I, I can't keep up with everything. I might try, but I can't. Yeah. So I, I heard the you know somebody mentioned the horse dewormer, and the FDA <laughs> put something out saying, "Hey, people, do not take horse dewormers. <laughs> it's not a good idea." And of course, they got lectured for you know not being respectful enough of the people who are taking the the horse dewormer. But, oh I, you know, I, I thought it was kind of a joke and then realized, no, um, this is a real thing. And it is being pushed by one Fox News host after another. I saw a tweet from a guy that I used to think was a reasonable human being who used to be a talk show host in, in Iowa. And it's like, what the f- what is wrong with you people? Senator Ron Johnson, who buys into every crackpot idea. But I mean, this is where we're at here, where it's it's not just the the recklessness and the stupidity. It's. Well, what is what is the next step beyond that? I mean, it's it, the idiocracy. I, I feel that we need to come up with some new n- new phraseology to describe what happens when, you know, you have people who say, I don't trust, you know, the scientific consensus about vaccines, but I'm going to trust this guy I heard on talk radio about horse dewormers. What do you do with a brain that broken? Derpitude. Yes, right, I yeah. don't know. I'll keep. I'll keep. I'll keep working on new words. Yeah. Herp derp. Idiot. Yeah. Uh, like morons. I look. I, this is also, by the way. Here's the other thing that's just alarming about all of this, and it's connected to the the election trutherism. Decently smart people are getting on board for it. Like it's not just you know just the kind of you know brain, broken brained mega you know, rally people wearing the Q shirts with the misspellings on it. Like, like it is intelligent people. Brett Weinstein yeah, is, is part of this little yeah, intellectual dark yeah. web crowd. He's been one of the biggest not pushers dark enough. of the ivermectin. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, like intelligent people with degrees and, and they're just, they've been so broken by either their contrarianism or their tribalism that, that like they're out there, uh, you know, try, determining that, that there's another medicine. Uh, look, I, I don't, I didn't, I didn't go to med school. I've got some buddies that did. I asked about them, but you don't have to go to med school to look at the fact that these vaccines, like ha- has there ever been a vaccine trial that has been this large in scope, right? I mean, like this has been, you know, like think about how many millions of people have now had these vaccines. We can see it with our eyes. You don't need to come up with the, some triple bank shot contrarianism about how it actually might be better to take a horse pill. Like, it's freaking nuts. And, and, and it is endemic. Look, L, um, uh, LSU, th- to thank goodness to John Bell Edwards, who's a nice moderate Democrat in Louisiana and has influence with the school as you know, there our football games are going to be uh require vaccines and i'm on the message board uh yesterday you know looking just trying to get an escape and trying to you know learn about who's going to be starting at safety and the message board is all of these nuts like freaking out about about how they might have to get a vaccine to go into the game like just just get just get a jab like just get the jab it is can you just i mean charlie uh, we are both pretty dark but could you have imagined me coming on this podcast like last Christmas and saying we're gonna this vaccine is gonna work. It's gonna have ninety plus percent efficacy, and and yet still next it will, everyone that wants it will be able to get it by by late April, early May, and yet still next August, some states like Florida are going to have more deaths per day than they did the entire no, pandemic we after we have a vaccine? What? Okay, so... I, what? I, and then the governors aren't even trying. And this is how it's tied to... Like, it's like, do people not give a f- f- shit about anyone's life? Like, the, that we can... The, the, the governor would watch that and say, like, well, I think my action is on Greg Abbott is I'm going to ban people it, it, from requiring really vaccines. conservative, too, yeah. It's just it's madness that there is that there is this just a complete that tribalism has become so so ingrained in everybody right now that that when that when their own side is making a mistake that is costing this the like light that uh, life and death mistake they can't just say okay like it's time to pivot here in Florida maybe we should have vaccine passports to like it's pretty crazy that uh, that more people are dying per day than have died the entire pandemic in my state. But they, they don't. They're not even. No. Trying. Okay. So I, I I hesitate to do this because it's it's a cliche, and it's it's old and it's not original. But I keep thinking about this. Okay. Because deep down inside, um, I go for these these I'm conventional ready. cliches. It's the it's the story of the drowning man. You know that story. You know. I don't know if it's big in Oakland, but you know. 
basically. I don't know if I know oh, the Drowning oh, okay, Man story. Okay, so so there's the, uh, the, G- the Jesus yeah, Drowning Man gets the So yeah, so there's okay. a big flood, and the guys uh, you know on the roof of the house, and you know the water's you know coming up and everything, and a guy in a rowboat comes by, and he says, "Jump in, I can save you." And the guy says, "No, I'm okay. I'm praying to God. God's going to save me." So the rowboat goes on, and then a motorboat comes by, and he says, "Hey, jump in, I can save you." And the stranded guy says, no, thanks. I'm praying to God because God's going to save me. I have faith. Motorboat goes on. Helicopter comes by. The water's getting higher and higher, right? You know, helicopter comes by. A pilot shouts down, grab the rope. I'm going to be able to lift you to safety. And the stranded guy says, no, thanks. I'm praying to God. God's going to save me. I have faith. So the helicopter flies away and the water keeps rising and he drowns. Okay. So he ends up bizarrely enough in heaven. He has a chance to discuss this with God. Um, and he says to God, God, I had faith in you, but you didn't save me. You let me drown. I don't understand. And God replies, I sent you a rowboat and a motorboat and a helicopter. What more did you expect? <laughs> See, this is what I'm screaming. It's like people are going, I, I'm, I'm trusting in God. You know, God, Jesus will save me from this. Jesus is going, man, I sent you the vaccine. I sent you all of this, this miracle cure. What more did you want? No, I'm waiting for a sign. I'm waiting for God to send me something that will save me. And it's like, here we are. So I'm sorry. It's like the, uh, there was a thing going around about the uh, lady who is at one of these school board meetings saying that if God wanted us to cover our nose and mouth <laughs> with a slave mask, he would have already, you know, we would have been born that way. And I'm, And you're like, you're wearing underwear. You're wearing, you're wearing you? glasses. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so one last thing in the time we have left, since you are on the left coast, um, what's uh, going to happen next week in California with this recall? Um, I don't understand California politics <laughs> these days. So yeah. uh, Gavin Newsom apparently is disliked by almost everybody. But could you just explain how it works? So there's all of these candidates on the ballot. And Gavin, there's two questions, right? So Gavin Newsom has to get 50% not to be recalled, right? Okay. Yeah. So if, yes, he, if he gets 50%, yeah. he's not recalled, no, nothing happens. But he stays. what happens if he doesn't get 50%? So let's say he gets 49%. Who becomes yeah. governor of your state? The winner of the second question, what? which is which is who do you think should be the governor if the recall happens, and and literally it could be someone that gets like eighteen percent of the vote. So so Gavin could get forty nine percent on on you know the question of the recall, um, and then he gets recalled, and then it, and then it drops to question two, and and whoever wins a plurality becomes the governor. And the Democrats, in their great wisdom, didn't want to offend Gavin or didn't want to confuse have confusing messaging, and so there really are no Democrats oh. on the next ballot. It's like a bu- it's like twenty Republicans and a bunch of weirdos there's this one guy who's a youtuber um who uh you know uh said that he wants to build a a, a pipe from the mississippi river to california to get us more water uh, he, i don't think he's learned about the continental divide yet um but he's the good democrats great hope um uh, uh, if if gavin doesn't get it it seems like the conservative talk show host larry oh, elder God. Um, who is a, who is an insane man? Um, would uh, is the favorite right now. There is in in normal times. There's like a normal Republican mayor of San Diego who 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 played a little too much footsie with Trump for my taste because he had broader ambitions. But like and not you know, not overtly insane. Yeah, not overtly insane. All things considered, with a Democratic legislature, he'd be a fine steward of the state for a year or two until he you know get beat gets beaten again. The problem is there's no constituency for him. Right. Like all, all of the, you know, the California Republicans are completely radicalized by having no power. And everyone who's like ra- who's who's basically, you know, sane has just become a, you know, a red dog Democrat here. And so there's no constituency for this mayor of San Diego. And so it's likely to be the talk show host. Here's the thing. Ugh. I don't think it's likely to be the talk show host, though. And, and, and you know, you get in trouble with predictions. And I, I just want to just want to say this, like uh, Gavin won by 23 points and and 2.5 million votes i'm going from memory but 2. Point something million votes last time this is very very different than the schwarzenegger recall you know when gray davis only won by a couple hundred thousand votes uh everyone another thing that's different everyone gets a ballot mailed to them here in california so you know it doesn't 
it doesn't take the kind of enthusiasm to vote that it might if you had to you know show up on a tuesday to the to the firehouse um you know all you have to do is sit at your kitchen table and put it in the mailbox so I, I just i just don't think that i think the math works in gavin's favor here even the fact that he has a lot of problems uh, it's just hard for me to imagine you know that a quarter that there's you know that big of a crossover um and the number of you know votes we already have had 2.7 million uh, ballots mailed in i, I yeah you know, anyway i've got some smart friends here who think that i'm being too sanguine about this but i i think that there's a little bit of bad wedding and and i think that the political media likes the story and i do think that gavin has some issues i don't think it's going to be a 20 point victory but but the idea that you'd go from a 22 23 whatever it was point victory down to to, to being recalled i, I just I find that hard to, to believe that that's going to okay, happen. I, I find a couple of things hard to believe. Uh, first of all, is, is the system was the system different when Arnold Schwarzenegger was elected after the? Okay, no. the system has been changed. No, no, that was the same. It was the same, it was the same, thing. same okay. system. See, yeah, because sorry, it yeah. seems to me absolutely crazy that you would have a situation where, as you point out, the next governor of California could get eighteen percent. Could have gotten eighteen percent of the vote. I mean, we're gonna talk, we we have a lot of. Uh, and defeat a guy that got 49%. Right, right. We have a lot of hyperbole about uh, minority rule and anti-democratic, but, th- yeah. but that's kind of breathtaking. When, I, again, <laughs> when I first read about that, after I got done reading about people taking horse warming medicine, um, <laughs> that I thought, no, this is wrong. This person is incorrect. There, there's no way yeah. that that could actually happen. No. no sane person would create a system in which somebody, a nut job like Larry Elder, could become governor of the uh, largest state in the country with less than one out of five votes, really. And it's true. It's just like, I don't know how people come up with, you know, Here's the other. Can I add another insane yeah. part to that? And something a nice life lesson learned for Democrats in the in Congress right now. The Democrats control everything here. They have a supermajority. They could have just changed the recall rules anytime between when they beat Arnold in 2006 or whatever he finally lost, um, and and 2019. Right, they could have just passed a bill that with their supermajority in the state legislature that said eh, either. You know that that changed the the rules around the recall, but they and there was talk of doing that, but you know they had to do other things like you know make it harder to build houses and appeal to every random um, you know constituency group in the in the uh, progressive orbit, and you know forgot to do you know some of the basics. So here, here's your really terrible timeline, Tim. Since we, yep. I, I know you like to indulge in, in bad timelines, I and know. I think we're in the worst one, but it could get it could get even worse. Um, is uh, let, let's let, let's imagine some that uh, uh, that Gavin Newsom gets uh, you know forty nine point nine percent of the vote is recalled, um, and that Larry Elder becomes the governor with eighteen percent of the vote. That would be great. <laughs> uh, he becomes the governor, and Dianne Feinstein has to leave the United States Senate, and he appoints yep. one of your Claremont uh, Institute flaming uh, nut jobs to the Senate. <laughs> Suddenly, not only is the California governorship uh, flipped, which is California's problem, but then it could also flip control of the United States Senate. I mean, a lot of things could happen here, which is why it's and relevant. Again, it would be again, it would be the Democrats' fault. That's another thing you could change, right? There's no rule like laid down by James Madison that says that a governor should get, should automatically get to a point, a, you know, to a full term or even a partial term. Um, uh, uh, you know, a senator, if if there's a vacancy, right? I mean, they could change the rules in the state that says some, to say something like, if a senator from X party, you know, has to vacate the seat, then the governor can choose from a you know group of three that are nominated by the state party. I, you know, there are a mon- bunch of different ways that they could do it, but the Democrats didn't do that either. So they've had complete con- like stranglehold, and um, you know, have been have been more worried about you know handing out doling out favors to you know the, the unions and people that endorse them than actually you know making sure the system works okay so we spent most of the morning here um agreeing with one another um i, I just have to mention that, okay, that great. It, Let's it, disagree. It, it does seem like you have a really really bad tape uh, a take on the nirvana baby lawsuit for for people who are not yeah. familiar can we give a little bit of background this is a, how old is he now? Is in his twenty something? Uh, you know, I think 31. 30, 31. Guy thirty one years old. He's now right? suing um, the the band because many many years ago they had an album cover. Uh, Nirvana had a, an album cover with an infant who's swimming in the water, and the infant is naked, 
And now after 31 years, this guy has decided that he's going to sue because he feels violated. And I, I, did I hear correctly on the live stream last night that you thought he might actually win this absolutely ridiculous, absurd, (laughs) self-indulgent, laugh out loud lawsuit that you actually thought he had a case? Really? I mean, his penis is on the cover. I, I don't think that he got, uh, you know, he consented to that. And I, you know, I hadn't really focused on the fact that the baby penis was on the cover. I, I think that this person obviously needs some some therapy, and um, uh, and he seems to be, have ridden this about this whole little minor fame as far as it could go. But why not? You get in front of the right judge. Uh, it is child pornography, technically, I guess. Um, and uh, no, I don't know, did his parents approve it? Is it ever, was it ever an issue? Did anybody ever say, hey, you can see that baby? No, but we've, but we've been more woke now, you know, oh. part of our woke culture. Now there's a different look. And I, 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 I don't know. Maybe he has a case. I do. No, I want to add no, one other no. thing to last night. I was attacked for an email for saying that the the unplugged, uh, Nirvana was was pretty basic and lame, and I stand by that uh, take. And but I will say, In Bloom um, on the record is fantastic, and I should have shouted out the Sturgill Simpson cover of In, In Bloom, which everyone everyone here will like, um, who likes either grunge or country. Uh, so you know that's my assortment of takes. Uh, he could win. He it, it seems like he was violated. His oh, penis was out on the album. Uh... And uh, the uh, unplugged is lame, and uh, you know Sturgill's cover of In Bloom is good. That's my assortment of takes on Nirvana. Never okay, mind. So the, the baby, the Nirvana baby, is named Spencer Eldon. He's now thirty years old, and he's he's now he's waited thirty years now to complain that he's uh, that Nirvana <laughs> knowingly produced, possessed, and advertised commercial child pornography, failed to take reasonable steps. The part that I liked the best was that you know all of the embarrassment that he suffered that that he can't get dates nobody will date him because as soon as they find out that he's the nirvana baby they don't want to have anything to do with him i mean <laughs> you believe that really get that bag get that bag what? i mean dave grohl's got money sitting around uh you know he started two other bands <laughs> another uh, band since then and he has a tv show and you know get a little cash oh, out of it Oh man it's just like yes you can sort of imagine it i have to tell you something uh, before we go on our date that <laughs> 30 years ago, I was the baby on the cover of Nirvana. Oh, so that's your dick? I mean, that, you, you, that is your, I don't want to have anything to do with that baby dick, right? I mean, that's really it. Yeah, I didn't realize how small you are. Yeah. Um, no, uh, it, it does Shrink. seem like that is probably not too. his strongest argument. No. Not his strongest <laughs> argument. If, if he can't get a date, it seems like he probably has other problems besides the baby penis. But, okay. Get the bag. So, Get that you bag. and I have talked about, we have talked about heroism, courage, the war. We've talked about refugees. We've talked about the coronavirus. 90, horse dewormer. Horse dewormer. 90% of my mail is going to be Charlie. I cannot believe that you're defending child pornography. <laughs> let, let me send you these monographs that I ha- that I found on the internet about the dangers of child and, oh, and the God. trauma of child pornography, et cetera, et cetera. So, well, send me the worst email that you get that's supporting oh, my get, position, and that might get me to flip. That might get me. No, to you'll flip. get them all. I mean, trust, trust me. Just check, check, check <laughs> your inbox because you're going to get every freaking one of them. Tim Miller, thank you so much for joining me on. Uh, well, it's 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 a Friday. The good news is there's a weekend coming up, I guess, right? So, thanks for coming back on the podcast. Thanks, Charlie. Peace, and thank you all for listening to today's Bulwark podcast. I'm Charlie Sykes. We will be back on Monday, and we'll do this all over again. A very very special guest, Dr. Russell Moore, will be joining us on the Bulwark podcast. Oh yay! Yep. So good. I, Listen I to that podcast. We got a lot of good ones coming up. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>